All right. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Claudette, and we've got our fourth session of our Ocean Youth Summit happening today, which is all about the places we love, the ocean things we love. We've covered off a few topics already, um, the importance of businesses saving our oceans. Um, we've talked about youth leadership and we've talked about what some of our ocean youth participants have been doing over the time that they've been doing the program. And so today we're gonna go back to where it all started, I suppose, and talk about the things we love, what actually attracts us to working in the field, in the area that we've chosen, um, why some of these places and, and things are so important to us. And we've got a range of speakers today. So we've got Kerry Cameron talking to us today about coral reef restoration or larval restoration, which is super interesting. Um, we've got Alison Jennings from the Shark Conservation Australia uh, group talking about shark conservation. We've got Chloe Satter from Sea Life Sunshine Coast talking about turtle rescue and rehab. And we will have one of our Ocean News participants from Melbourne talking about her uh, project that she came up with last year to start helping our rivers and oceans with the single use plastic issue, which is super exciting. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to our Ocean Youth Ambassadors to take over the session. So I think today we've got Georgia, who's going to be interviewing Kerry. So I'll hand it over to you both. Hi everyone. So I'm Georgia and today I'm here with Kerry Cameron. So Kerry has a PhD in restoring damaged coral reefs with associated um, with assisted larval provision and is currently working in Australian fisheries in Coffs Harbour, New South Wales. So this is a really exciting project that she's been working on over the past little while. So um, Kerry, do you want to talk about a bit about your PhD and what you're currently working on as well? Oh, thanks, Georgia. Thanks for having me. Hi, everybody, wherever you all are. Um, so yeah, my name is Kerry Cameron. I've got, I wear two hats, um, which I'll, I'll come to a bit later on. So my day job, which is where I mostly get paid for, is working for the Australian government um, on fisheries and threatened species and things like that. Um, but what I love to do is my PhD, and that's looking at coral reef restoration. I'm just going to share my screen to show you a picture of what um, the kind of restoration that we do. Lots of people have heard of coral gardening. No, I can't find my cursor thingy. Um, which is where um, lots of people around the world will find a donor colony of coral. They'll break off little pieces of it. They'll grow them out in a nursery somewhere and they put those back on the reef or onto some kind of structure. So that's probably the most famous or the most well-known type of coral, uh, coral reef restoration. We do a different one. It's called larval restoration. I'm just going to show you a picture of that, kind of a diagram, so to speak. So this is like a, I guess, a, a cartoonish version of what we do. So our team, and it's, it's myself and a bunch of other people, um, I'm only a very small fish in the, in the whole thing, um, we go to reefs that we know very well when we know when they're going to spawn. So many species of coral, um, they reproduce by releasing their gametes, so their sperm and their eggs in little bundles. And they do this <clears throat> in a very short season of every year. So um, we know when they're going to do it in reefs that we know well. So we go out there on spawning nights and we wait for them to spawn. And when they spawn, when they release those little bundles, in this picture it's the little pink little blobs that are floating up to the surface. Uh, we collect those bundles after they've been released and then we contain them for about a week. And that containing is really important because in a natural ocean system, um, those little bundles of eggs and sperm, they'll mix together on the surface of the water. And if there's enough of them together, then the right sperm will make the right egg from the right species, but not the same coral, because you want to have parents from different individuals. Um, and they'll make a new coral larvae, like a little tiny slug-like thing. Um, but in the areas that we're working in where coral reefs are degraded, there are so few parents that there isn't enough uh, volume of these gametes, these sperm and egg bundles, uh, to make enough larvae. So in these areas where reefs are degraded and there's not many corals there, we catch what there is and we bring it together and we hold it together and keep it safe for a week. And over that week, the sperm and the eggs will, well, first of all, they'll, they'll form a little embryo very quickly. Uh, and then it takes about a week for that little embryo to become a larvae, like a little tiny swimming slug about one or two millimetres long. And when that's ready, it'll swim down to the bottom, but we actually help that too. We'll take the larvae when they're ready to spawn, sorry, ready to settle, and we'll take them down to the bottom and we'll put them uh, right onto the bottom under kind of an underwater tent. And that's that um, white thing down the bottom on the right, a larval settlement tent. Uh, and then we contain them in that tent for sort of a 
few days. Um, and then over that time, they'll go down to the bottom and they'll settle. They'll stick themselves onto the bottom, find a good spot, and they'll metamorphose from a little squishy larvae into a baby coral. And once they've metamorphosed into a coral, they'll start to make a coral skeleton made of calcium carbonate or limestone. And that's what grows and grows and creates a reef. And then within two or three years, if we've done it right, they'll start spawning themselves and kind of closing that loop. So that's what larval restoration is. That's what I've been working on um, in my PhD for the last few years. Um, I didn't invent it. I'm very proud of the people, my friends who did. Um, what I've been doing is looking at different aspects of coral larval ecology and their settlement preferences to make it um, work a bit better. So if we're gonna do this as a method, how can we do it the best way? So how many larvae should we put out per meter squared to get the best growth? Uh, is there a best time of day to release them so they'll settle quickly? Um, putting out those tents is probably the hardest part. So what we're trying to do is get around that and just find kind of that magical sweet spot uh, when you let them go and they'll settle straight away and, and start metamorphosing very quickly. So that's what I've been focusing on. I guess um, applied ecology of different ways we can manipulate um, our methods so that we can get the best outcome for science. So that's, that's what I've been doing. It's been great. Yeah, that's awesome. So is that in Australia or in other countries overseas? Um, we've mostly, mostly started in the Philippines, so we've been working in the northwestern Luzon and Bolanao. Um, actually, these corals on the left-hand side of that picture, that's uh, one of our restored areas. So these corals there are about, I think in this picture, they're three years old, um, and they're spawning really beautifully. So that, those sites there are, are really great. They're going very well. Um, there's hardly any adult corals away from our um, restoration sites. We had to go, initially, they had to go a long way to get um, the, the corals to be the donor colonies for the sperm and the eggs. Uh, but now there's some really good dense patches where we've had these tents and you take the tents away after five days, but then, you know, three, four, five, six years later, when you swim over them, you can see those squares where the tents used to be that are now full of coral. So Philippines is kind of our amazing, beautiful show site. Um, and we've started working on the Great Barrier Reef in the last few years. So um, when this idea first started, there, was, there wasn't even a restoration or a... Um, uh, yeah, I guess a restoration policy on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia because the reef was so big and it was so healthy and so fine, no one thought there'd be any need to have to have restoration on the Great Barrier Reef. But um, in 2016 and 17, we started having some really huge back-to-back -back bleaching events where lots and lots of the reef died. Uh, and now restoration is, is a pretty big, pretty big business or becoming a very big um, focus in Australia as well. So yeah, mostly working in the Philippines, but we've um, increasing work in the in Great Barrier Reef as well. What inspired you to get involved in the fields of marine science and coral restoration specifically? Um, I grew up in Southeast Australia. So now I've lost the Zoom screen, sorry, just a second. There we go. Um, I learned to dive um, in a little town called Marimbula down on the south coast of New South Wales. If anybody knows that, there's some awesome tugboats and um, cool spots to dive down there. So I always grew up camping and, and sort of being an ocean kid. Um, and my first jobs in marine, biology were in Florida in the US um, and then on Heron Island of the Great Barrier Reef. So um, even though I was brought up as a temperate water kid, um, I very quickly learned that it's much more pleasant in warm water. <laughs> so I avoid cold water now. Hats off to all of you cold water temperate people, but yeah, I'll pick the tropics any day. So um, I love coral reefs. They're really beautiful. They're really diverse. Um, just the, the array of life is just incredible. So that's, for me, that was what inspired me to get involved in it. Um, I guess when I started working in marine science, it was in the late 90s um, and reefs were kind of, they were having some issues, but they were kind of mostly okay. Like I mentioned, even three or four years ago, the Great Barrier Reef didn't even have a restoration policy, but now it does. So um, over that 20 years or so, I guess watching decline in reefs worldwide has been super sad because I know, like when you see those photos of bleached dead reefs, like I know what should be there and to see them all just, you know, dead and horrible is really quite distressing. So. Um, yeah, to want to be a part of working out solutions to help reefs, that's what inspired me to get involved. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. So on that note, what do you wish more people knew about coral and restoration? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, it's a really diverse field. Like I mentioned at the start, that lots of people have heard of coral gardening. That's probably the most well-known one. Uh, so that's, that's really well known. There's what we do, which is um, with the larvae and um, I guess another a word for that could be larval reseeding, so to reseed reefs with larvae. There's people who are doing um, stuff with shading the water to kind of protect reefs. It's a really diverse field, and I guess what I would 
I would like everyone to know, including people in restoration, is that it's um they're all just different tools. So it doesn't you don't there isn't one right way to do reef restoration. Um, there's lots of different ways to do science and different ways to do um, marine park management that can help support reefs. And I think it's just really important for everyone to to not pick a side and go, oh, it's well, I'm a gardener, well, I'm a liable person. Like, I think there's there's different um, solutions that are best for different areas. So I think just being aware that it's quite a diverse field um, and that people have, you know, strong opinions about what's the best way and the right way. Um, and they're probably all right in different areas. So just having an open mind to different techniques for different areas, um, I think it's really important. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. So given the current climate, have you seen any benefits of the COVID lockdown on reef restoration? Was it too brief a period or is it too early to tell in that sense? So speaking personally, it's just been a real pain in the bum. <laughs> like, um, yeah. we, we were supposed to be in the Philippines. So in the Philipp we, like so our work particularly is very seasonally dependent. So coral reefs um, or, or coral species will have quite a short window where they will, where they will spawn. So um, if you miss that window, you miss it for the whole year. So we, we normally spend, in the Philippines, they, the, the reefs that we work at spawn in mostly March, April, and sometimes into May, depending on the species. So we couldn't go. Like, we were stuck in Australia. So, um, and our, our awesome team in the Philippines, they were right there, but they weren't allowed into the field. So um, the big thing with COVID, and a lot of you guys who, who like going out diving and snorkeling will probably know, all the boats shut down because you can't have people close together on boats. So um, field work got cancelled, diving got cancelled, everything got cancelled. So um, in our in our sphere, it was quite disruptive. We've missed that season now in the Philippines. So all those those corals would have spawned anyway out there in the wild. Um, but as I mentioned before, they're too far apart. So they probably, even though they spawned, without that help to kind of bring that larvae together and, and contain it, probably it's going to be a bit of a dead year or a wasted year. So that's it's just been kind of annoying, really, just having to sit on our hands and wait it out. Um, for other other groups, so I think, and it's just from looking on Twitter and on Facebook, I think some of the gardening, coral gardening groups, uh, which are mostly in the Caribbean, I think they've had a similar kind of situation. Like you see a lot of people going, oh, we're stuck, we can't go anywhere. So they're kind of looking after their, their coral nurseries, but they can't get out onto boats to go and put them back out there on the reef. So... You know, I guess it's always a good time for reflection and that's that's valuable. But, um, yeah, in terms of restoration, I think because restoration is an active intervention, when you can't go and do anything, it's just kind of been a bit of a, a bit of a dead space. So, yeah, it's been disappointing, to be honest. But um, but it's been good to have that time to think and, and plan and make sure we're doing things the right way. So, yeah, onwards and upwards, I hope. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Cool. Yeah, so hopefully you guys will be able to get back at that soon. Yeah. Um, on the same kind of thread, will the demise of the cruise industry, do you think, have a positive impact on the reefs yeah, in Australia cool, particularly? Yeah, cool question. Um, I haven't really thought that through. I guess um, I think that it's probably too early to say how long that, that depressed cruise industry will, will go on for. I, I presume, I mean, there's no one going out at the moment, but and I kind of thought, oh, well, that'll be the end of that. But you see lots of people in the news of interviewing people like, oh, I can't wait to go on my next cruise. And thinking, oh, gosh, why would you want to go on a cruise ship after all that? Um, but people still do, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so there's some people who will always want to go on cruise ships. So it may, it may come back. I think the main impacts of cruise ships are, I guess, the fuel use. So they're burning fossil fuels to, to you know, tramp around. Um, and there's also some localised impacts on local reefs. So... I guess those things will have had a enjoyed a brief reprieve and that's probably good. But um, yeah, I don't know if we can tell yet whether there'll be a lasting impact or not. Um, certainly those little villages and islands that we would have like a thousand tourists landing on them, you know, it's probably good for their reefs, but it's probably not great for the local economy. So I guess, you know, the people there might find, want, want to find other ways to get tourists in there. So, um, but yeah, same with, with us having to have a break. I hope that just this period of enforced, you know, sitting back and just waiting for the world to get back to normal. Hopefully people can use that time to think about how they can do it in a lower impact way. But yeah, wait and see, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. We do have a few minutes left, but I do have a question for you here from Alison. Sure. Are there any parts of the Great Barrier Reef which may not come back to life or are declared dead officially? Um, I don't think there's many that would be entirely dead. So so coral bleaching, which is which is where the, the really serious um, uh, heat event, heat stress events we had in 2016, 17, and then again in 17, 18. Um, some species are more susceptible than others. So the ones that, that we work on, the acropora, they're, they're branching quite skinny. Uh, they grow really fast. They're kind of often called the weedy species in, in corals. Um, 
they'll get knocked out pretty quickly. But often the really big old corals, which are the big boulder corals, which would be like your big, I don't know, river red gums in a forest or something, the big old, old, you know, thousands of years old, they will often not die in a bleaching event. So you might get uh, many species that will be knocked out in a, in, a, in a bad bleach, but you probably won't get every single coral knocked out in a bad bleach. So I think what the, um, it's kind of, sadly, it's a bit of a, an increasing scale, but in terms of reef severity, um, it's unusual to find a reef that's 100% dead, but anything with more than, you know, more than half of them dead is, is bad. So, um, and I guess it's, um, the reef itself might not be entirely dead, but the, the structure and the function of it will change. So when you knock out all those branching corals, um, the, the skeleton will stay there for a, a while and provide structure and habitat for fish. But when the coral itself, when the animal living over the skin of the, of the, of the rocky skeleton is dead, the rock inside will quickly degrade and kind of crumble away. So when you visit a reef, like maybe six months or a year after a bad bleach, from on top it looks sort of the same. You can still see all the same shapes and the structures. But when you get down there, it's just all covered in slime and gunge and that the fish have changed. They're not yellow, colourful coral fish. They're like algal grazing, surgeon fish, things like that. If you go back another year, all of those chunks are kind of turned into rubble. So it just becomes like a rubble field. So, but there'll still be pockets of big old corals in there. So the reefs, if they were left alone with cool water, they would recover, but it would take, you know, tens, decades, hundreds of years, depending on the species richness. So... Yeah, it's a tricky question. Like, um, there's, there's pockets that got hit really, really badly, but it's probably unlikely that every single coral died, but most of them might have. And, and the, the um, ecological role that those corals play um, and the, the structure that's there might have changed probably for the rest of our lifetimes, which is super sad. Yeah, it's awful, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, so kind of to finish up, what are the primary challenges faced by the reefs and what can the average individual really do to do it, make a positive impact in that sense? Yeah, for sure. Good question. Um, the, the number one change, challenge is climate change, without a doubt. So, um, and that's, I think, probably a big challenge that we have in coral restoration is that we're trying to do things that will really help corals uh, locally and in the short term to kind of hang in there. So we can buy them time, but we can't actually fix them. So it's super frustrating when you out there working really hard and the media come out and go oh this is fantastic and you think yeah it is fantastic but then the headline is scientists save the reef i'm like well, we're actually not going to save the reef this isn't going to save the reef that might help it hang on and that's really important to bite some more time but to save the reef we need to we need to reduce our carbon emissions so uh, at an individual level i think it's really important to think about your own choices as a consumer so try and minimize your own carbon footprint so travel um sensibly so don't don't drive places you don't need to don't fly places you don't need to um try and replace meat in your diet um not totally if you love having a steak or bacon but you know maybe maybe eat less meat because meat um you know meat production has a high carbon footprint um but i think what's really important is to is to get educated and then get vocal about it so um try and convince people around you to kind of improve their behavior as well but, but part of that is not to be vocal and kind of get in everyone's face and be really, you know, aggro about it because that just turns people off. But to, to be a good listener, find out if people aren't changing their behaviour, find out why, like what are their stresses and problems and maybe just help them find alternate ways to live that isn't quite so carbon intensive. So, I don't know, they sound like the kind of things that you hear all the time, but as, as a, in our family, we try and really do that. So, um, yes, we have to fly to go to coral spawning events, but we try and mitigate that by planting trees on our property and we try and not drive our cars when we can and... Um, choose like low petrol consuming cars and things like that so and we try and you know minimize our meat and things like that so it's kind of hard like it's a very great big problem we're all just individuals but we also all have a voice so um, I think being a good listener and being a good speaker about these things and um, you know being an influencer within your sphere of trying to you know encourage people to live more sustainably I think is really important yeah that's awesome thank you so much no worries so for those of you that have come late to the session, uh, the sessions are all about Ocean Youth, our program to help build and support young change makers who are passionate about securing the future health of our ocean. So we run a program annually. You can find out more about it at oceanyouth.org. And we're always open to collaborating with different partners so that we can start to grow the movement because it's all about making change fast and how can we all go about doing that so um, as you can see we've got some amazing young people who are participating in our program and we just need more 
we need to be supporting more and more of these young people and, um, and, and growing our movement. So thanks both. Um, so our next session is sharks, for all things sharks. We've got Alison Jennings, who uh, used to work when I was at Sea Life Trust. Alison and I worked together with a whole bunch of other people on shark conservation issues. And the biggest threat our sharks face locally is um, those horrendous shark nets sitting off our coasts. Uh, so Alison was fairly um, vocal and active in a lot of the shark campaigns around getting rid of the shark nets at that time. Uh, and Alison is going to be interviewed by Jess Diasetis, who is one of our Ocean Youth alumni up at Sunshine Coast. So Alison and Jess, I'll hand it over to you. Hi, everyone. Hey, Jess. Hey. <laughs> um. I feel like a good place to start was uh, me. When did your love for the ocean begin? Um, gee, probably when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> as cliche as it sounds, uh, I spent a lot of time at the beach as a kid and mm. I went on like road trips and holidays with my family up to the coast and mucked around in rock pools and all sorts of things. And yeah, and then as I got older, um, I wanted to know what was under the water. So I took a trip during my university years to Heron Island and I got to snorkel out around Heron Island, which is the southern part of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and that's when I also then made the decision, you know what, snorkeling sucks. You can't see much when you're up above, so you need to go get a scuba diving qualification. So I went back to Sydney and became a scuba diver. And yeah, that's basically where it was all born. What made, motivated you to protect sharks in particular? Um, sharks, I, if anyone knows me personally, I don't do cute and fluffy, <laughs> even though I'm wearing a bit of a fluffy hood at the moment. Um, I live down the mountain, so it's cold. Uh, yeah, I don't do cute and fluffy. And I was, as a young person, I was also, you know, typical kid. I was afraid of sharks. I think it's because you got the grey nose sharks and their little toothy grin. And their teeth do stick out and they don't look particularly pleasant. And then I thought to myself, you know what, maybe they're not as bad as they're, you know, they're depicted in movies, the media, etc. Um, so I wanted to find out more. And then when I got to go snorkeling and also become a scuba diver and seeing these animals underwater, that's also what made me learn to want to know more. So yeah, that's why I decided to look at sharks. What's your favourite shark species? Have you got a favourite? <laughs> I do have a favourite. Actually, it's the grey nurse shark. They, they call them the Labradors of the sea. They're very Great. gentle. They will not bite you unless you provoke them. Um, or unfortunately, they end up on the end of a fishing line, which they shouldn't be. Um, but yeah, I've been on the water with them. I've had about 12 of them around me and they don't do anything. And if you blow bubbles, they will just cruise away quietly. They're really awesome. And all of them have their own unique spot pattern on the, on their sides, a bit like our fingertips. And this is their unique identifier. So there's actually a really cool program called Spotter Shark. If you happen to get the opportunity to go diving or, or happen to see one snorkeling and you're able to get a photo, submit the photo through and it's like a big database. And that's how we can sort of keep track of this critically endangered species. That's really cool. Um, I really want to know, when did you join Sea Shepherd's Apex Harmony campaign and are you still involved with it today? Okay, I'm no longer part of Sea Shepherd. I started Sea Shepherd back in 2018, but I joined mm -hmm. Sea Shepherd in 2012 and I became the coordinator for New South Wales for Apex Harmony in 2014. Um, and i have been working on a shark campaign over that four and a bit years. And now I'm with Shark Conservation Australia and we're quietly working on a few little things in the background at the moment. Um, a few of us, outside of volunteering, a few of us also work full time like myself. Um, I actually work at Threadbow. So I'm up the mountain in the snow at the moment. Um, but yeah, we, we basically, like a lot of orgs, we all run um, volunteers and we try to do what we can with the time we've got. But a lot of people I know who are in this field are very passionate. Um, my well, the founder of Shark Conservation in Australia, Ashley and her sister, Sarah, um, two of the most awesome people I know and very passionate about sharks. And 
they're not a big org, but they will do big things and we're working on some stuff at the moment. Kind of, on a day-to-day -day basis, what kind of things do you encounter or involve yourself in? Uh, lately I haven't because I've actually had to move out of Sydney and come down the snow mountains, but um, when I was in the thick of everything, um, and I'll, actually, I'll take it back to 2014, this is when all the big shark rallies were coming across Australia from WA all the way across to the East Coast, Melbourne, etc. Um, God, where did I start? I've been doing um, PR, I've been uh, talking to media, putting out media releases, um, talking, the biggest thing I've been doing every day though is talking to everyday people, um, the general public about sharks and why they're important, why we need them and why we shouldn't be killing them. Um, I'd be talking about the shark nets. Uh, as Claudette said, it's probably the biggest, if not um, key impact thing that happens towards sharks in New South Wales. Aside from um, commercial and recreational fishing, that's another little sphere that I won't get into at the moment. Um, but yeah, just ultimately just education, education, education. And I think that's one of the big key factors with sharks is that if you ha um, you can sort of break down the fear factor, and unfortunately that Hollywood movie Jaws did a lot of damage about sharks, um, and also our general media. I mean, you've only got to look at the news cycle and look at the language that's used in headlines and also in um, just general uh, news bites and articles in newspapers and you will see the, the terminology that's used around these animals. Now, sharks will generally not come anywhere near you unless you happen to A, provoke them or B, you're pro you happen to have a food source nearby and they want to check you out. Um, but yeah, other than that, uh, I was running, I did events, we did, when I was in Sea Shepherd, we actually brought Shark Spotters, which is a program from South Africa, very successful program, which I believe should be here in New South Wales and well, probably across the country as well. Um, the whole premise behind it is there's uh, spotters in two different places. They work with the surf life savers. There's a set of colored flags. Every day, there's the conditions put out on a notice board so people can make the decision for themselves whether they go in that water. And there'll also be a color flag corresponding to those conditions. Then that empowers the ocean user to decide, well, you know what? It's looking a bit sharky today, as they like to say. Maybe I won't go there. Or if there's been an incident recently and it's on the board, then they can make the decision whether they want to go in or not. Yeah, that, that, I like that idea. It is. Um, so when you were out in the field, did you spend more time campaigning on shore or out at sea? On shore. I was purely onshore volunteer um, yeah. and still onshore. And I believe that's the most effective way we can break down um, this issue. A lot of people, they do like to go to the beach for a swim and a lot of people will never ever go underwater. But a lot of people will also watch movies and TV and see things in newspapers and on the internet and on social media. And, you know, these are the people we need to help understand why we need to have sharks and why they're so important for our oceans and the health of our oceans and not to fear them. And it's also by helping them break down that fear, we're also helping them understand why we can't have shark nets and why they're pointless and why they won't keep people safe. Yes. So my cat is right here, so. <laughs> my <cat. laughs> Hey, animal interruptions. <laughs> Um, so would you mind telling us all a little about the shark nets and drum lines? Especially okay, so, in New South Wales. So, so I, yeah, as I said, I primarily dealt with New South Wales. I had a colleague up in Queensland. Um, so the, the whole sort of shark control thing sort of started around about 1935. Um, there was, you know, a spate of people getting bitten and unfortunately they were dying. <laughs> But we also need to remember, too, back in them days, medical technology was not fantastic. <laughs> People would bleed out. Um, medical knowledge wasn't great, and they didn't, you know, have the means and uh, the mechanics to be able to help people uh, when it came to trauma injuries. Uh, you also had a time where in places like Parramatta River and Sydney Harbour, they would just dump in anything and everything in there. So if the abattoir was nearby, they'd be jumping all the, you know, the entrails and whatever into there. And you can imagine what kind of environment that's cooking up. So 
Hence why you're probably going to see then interactions between humans and sharks. So they developed this thing called the Shark Menace Committee. Horrible name for a committee. And then around about 1937 is when the first shark net went in in New South Wales. And then from then on, it's just slowly grown pretty much from the Sydney suburbs. It's gone out to the central coast of Newcastle and down the Illawarra. Queensland also has its own program too. It started in the 1960s and it pretty much runs, uh, say, Gold Coast up to around, uh, not as far as the Great Barrier Reef. There's no nets in the reef. There's only drum lines on the reef. But um, the thing we, I've noticed over time, and I've had the opportunity to be able to go into the historical records in New South Wales down in Sydney, yeah. is that over time you do see the depletion of the number of sharks they're catching in the early days versus for what they're catching now. And you can imagine thousands. And this is based also to what records we can see and know and how accurate those records were. And I'll be honest, back in the day, people weren't fantastic with keeping records. And I wouldn't be surprised if the number that I sort of know, which is around about the 20 odd thousand sharks is actually far more than that. And back in the day, they also used to count pregnant females and their pups too. So much more again. Um, Nets in New South Wales are 150 metres long. They sit a few metres off the sea, off the sea bottom and a few metres from the top of the sea floor. So they're basically suspended. Best way to look at it is it's like a tennis net. Thing is, they don't go from headland to headland. So if you're at the beach, say you're at Manly, it's not going to go from that headland there to that headland there. It's just suspended in the water. So anything can swim under, around or over it. Um, so how effective is that for... <laughs> so I should say, not really. But that said, it's catching these days. We're seeing, um, particularly in the last five years, I've seen well over 90% of the animals that are caught in these nets are non, what they call a non-target species. So when you're looking at a shark, uh, what they call the shark meshing program um, report that comes out every year, and there should be one due soon for this last year, is you'll see it divided into target species and non-target species. So for a long time, target species was actually quite a decent list of sharks. Um, just recently with the review of what they call the joint management agreement, they've actually revised that down to the top three da dangerous sharks to humans. So you will see basically your, your white, your tiger and your bull, and then everything else underneath is a target species. And unfortunately it's the big block of non-target species that are being caught. Things like dolphins, things like turtles. Turtles can only be underwater for 30 minutes approximately before they have to surface to get a breath. That's how they die in nets, they drown. Same with dolphins. Um, you'll also see things like finfish. You'll see non-target shark species like the critically endangered grainer shark, like angel sharks. Um, rays, they make up massive numbers in the shark meshing statistics. Yes, um, I understand that it's very easy to focus on all the negatives, but what are some achievements you are most proud of? Uh, back in 20, well, back in 2015, when New South Wales mm -hmm. had a premier named Mike Baird, uh, Claudette would know about this. Uh, we were able to agitate as part of a group to try and get a shark summit together. So we had people come from all over the world, media and also conservation groups. And we met in Sydney to discuss shark conservation and shark conservation issues. I think that's a big step forward. Uh, there was also meetings between um, numerous say conservation group representatives and members of government. And that's when basically the 2015 trial kicked off in terms of what they called um, shark mitigation technology. So looking into things that were potentially an option to replace nets. So out there you've got lots of technologies that are available. Some have been scientifically robustly tested, others not so much. Um, but we saw trials of things like clever boy, um, the eco shark barrier, and also that's when there was a lot of chatter about these things called smart drum lines. So up in Queensland, they use what they call traditional drum lines. So you'll have a big boy, and then off that is a nice big hook, chain, a uh, hook on a chain, and also an anchor line. And 
uh, if anyone's seen photos of what dies on that, it's, that's a pretty horrific way to die if you're an animal and you get hooked on that. Um, but what they did, they've developed was basically a smart version. So the best way to describe it is you've got this, it's a traditional, but it's got a GPS device in it. So what will happen is something will come along, hook onto the hook. It's almost like a dinner bell in a way. It pulls that and triggers the GPS signal. That gets sent off to a satellite. That then gets pinged down to the contractor who's usually looking after that set of smart drum lines. They get a notification going, oh, there's something on my drum line. Got to go check it out. So then they've got a time limit to get out to that drum line, check it. Um, they may tag it. If it's a um, non-target species, say it's a turtle, they have permission to release it. If it's injured, they are obligated to bring it in for treatment. Um, so yeah, smart drum lines, they've been trialled off Sydney, they've been trialled off down the south coast. Um, the most notorious trial of that has been off the north coast of New South Wales, up around Ballina. Um, previously to that, they'd had considered putting nets in there as well, and there was a lot of opposition to that. And that's where a lot of, besides myself and lots of other um, people working in the same area, we put a lot of effort into uh, basically making the public aware up there, if you put nets in, this is what's going to happen. And they did. And it killed a lot of non-target species. They put smart drum lines in. Uh, there's lots of sharks being caught on that, but we've also witnessed sharks going past the smart drum line line. Because what they'll do is they'll put them in a line off the back of the beach. So there's technologies that you can also wear as well. Um, for instance, there's the repeller, which you can have installed in your snowboard. You can also get the shark shoe, which you can wear. There's shark bands. Uh, there's also electromagnetic uh, kelp technology, which is being tested at the moment as well. And there's drones. Drones are massive, and I think drones need to be rolled out more and used more. Um, there's plenty of, uh, and they can actually be really well teamed up with the shark spotting program. And like I mentioned before, shark spotting programs. Um, Implementing uh, tourniquet stations as well. Uh, if, you, if someone is bitten by a shark, it is crucial to give them immediate first aid if they have a chance of survival. So if you've got that little medical kit available with instructions and anyone can know how to do this if the right instructions are there, you can save a life. There's lots and lots of things that are coming out all the time. But there are also some technologies on the market that haven't been so scientifically um, backed and you can also sort of make a bit of a valuation yourself with your common sense and think to yourself, is that really going to stop me from being approached by a shark? Yeah. Um, I'm going to try and word this the best way I can. But um, So is there something that you'd really like to see change? Is there an alternative that you'd really like to be introduced or... <laughs> I suppose for me personally as an ocean user, I don't care about having anything there. I accept the fact that every time I go in that water, I am in an open wild environment. Who am I to impose what I need and my boundaries on a system that has been functioning perfectly for millions of years? I accept every time I go in the water as a diver, I might encounter a shark. You know what? I mean, it's home. It's not in mine. Until sharks start walking onto land, <laughs> this is how I am. But I understand there are people who are afraid. Yeah. And, you know, unfortunately, as I said, media and movies play a big part in that. Um, I'd like to see more of an analysis done by governments in terms of what's appropriate for beaches, for beaches across our coastline and what we can implement. I'd like to... Biggest thing I'd like to see is more public education and shark spotting programs, um, more drones in the air. Not every beach is going to have uh, the opportunity to have the same technology. Some beaches are more dynamic. Uh, for instance, up on the north coast, they tried to implement um, basically barrier systems like they've done over in WA in a place called Coogee. They implemented the um, eco shark barrier over there. It's been very successful. Fine. It's also a very low energy environment compared to somewhere like Ballina and all the other beaches nearby, which often, you know, get a lot of energy. They also get the, the um, leftovers of what they call the East Coast lows and cyclones and things like that. So lots of energy, which would just basically thrash everything to pieces. So that's where you've got to, you know, really think about what you're going to put in there. 
Um, yes. I don't believe right now we should even have nets in the water. They take them out during whale migration, which if you've got to give New South Wales government a tick for, that's it. The Queensland government need to do the same thing. They never do. They never take their nets out. This is why we're seeing whale entanglements. But I'd like to okay. see nets gone completely. They're, they're, it's time they're gone. That's why. <laughs> 2020, come on. Um. So. What are some things we can all do to help protect shark populations and ultimately save our oceans? So in terms of sharks, um, sharks are impacted quite significantly across the world. So I'll basically go out mm -hmm. of Australia for a bit now. Um, one of the biggest factors that impact shark populations is the shark fin trade and yes. also shark products. Uh, check what you're buying. Like, even here in Australia, we have probably got products on our supermarket shelves, on our chemist shelves and all the other places, cosmetics, etc., that contain things like swelling, shark liver oil. We sell shark liver oil tablets in um, chemists and health food shops. We don't need these things. And uh, I find it very strange that we choose to consume something like shark liver oil and the liver is designed to detox the body. So why are we eating something that, yeah, doesn't make sense to me? Um, and the high levels of mercury. Oh, 100%. Don't eat shark at all. Don't eat. If you go to the fish, if you still eat fish, I don't eat fish at all. Um, I don't eat seafood, period. But if you go to the fish and chip shop or you go to the restaurant and they say fish and chips, ask what it is. Because 99.9% of, .9 of the time, it's usually flake, which is shark, and it's considered to be either school shark, gummy shark, etc. Um, and, um, in yeah, 2019, I reached out to a cafe that's in Wynnum and they sold flake. So I asked them what the species was and they said reef shark. <laughs> did, they but did they take it off the menu? Um, that's what I'm trying to, that's what I'm working on. I've got a petition up and... Awesome. And that's what you can do. You can politely ask anyone who's serving shark you know, hey, this is what's going on with sharks around the world. This is why we need sharks in our oceans. They're super important for the health of our oceans. They basically keep all the populations, as an apex predator, everything below. So all your big mammals, all your big fish, they keep everything in a nice balance and check by removing the sick, the dying and the dead. Um, if you don't have sharks, and we've seen this across other places around the world where we see fisheries collapses because you're removing that animal that's keeping everything in check, everything else goes out of kilter. So then the big fish eat the little fish and then there's nothing else and then the plants die and everything, you know, the aquatic plants die, the corals die out, all sorts of things happen. Um, they are so important. And if we don't have sharks, effectively, our ocean system will eventually collapse. Yes, but what sorry. we can also do is write to our members of parliament, even try and get a meeting with your member of parliament. Um, talk to your classmates, talk to your teacher. Um, you're part of Ocean News, which is awesome. Encourage your friends to become part of Ocean News and join programs like that. Um, get educated about, you know, the issues that impact sharks. Uh, what we can do when we go to the ocean, you know, in terms of technologies and Talk to people around you and go, hey, you know, I know you're a surfer. Have you heard about this cool technology? Things like that, especially if they're a little bit fearful of sharks. Um, but ultimately, you need to have a, sorry, you need to have, sorry, you need to have a lot of resi um, resilience though, because so many people they'll ignore you or just not answer. Um, so last year, I also reached out to just over 50 companies, I believe that were selling cosmetics and supplements with squalene and shark cartilage and a few a few did respond but so many didn't and it it there are there are company and they won't even respond to a customer related question and it's it can be very hard so have you experienced anything like that or I'm sure you have <laughs> Is it bad to say I've experienced that with the New South Wales government? Um, <laughs> they're not the easiest. Uh, governments are never the easiest people to play ball with. Claudette can probably testify to this. 
Um, but you just kind of keep chipping away. Sometimes it's also yeah. just how how you go about um, how you go about talking to the person, and then okay. also trying different avenues as well. Like perhaps also talking to different parties. So, for instance, not necessarily the person who's in government in power at the time, but you could also try the opposition or try other parties that are in the Senate and see what their views are as well. I mean, for instance, I've done a lot of work with Justin Field. Um, he was He's a former Greens MP, but he's now independent, and I still talk to them. Um, I've done work with uh, Kate, Kate Furman, who used to be the chair of Sea Shepherd Australia, um, and the Greens have been very approachable. And I've had chats with Labor. I've chats with Liberals. So, you know, it's a case of just... There are, there are people, I mean, there are people in there who are just going to toe the party yeah. line, regardless of who you talk to. But there's always a few people in there. You can find them. They'll be there. And ultimately, you've got to kind of appeal to their emotional side. A lot of people like the ocean. Why do they go there? Just pick it apart. It was an incredible session. We do need to just keep moving forward. But I think yeah, sure. that was... Um, to sum up, and in response to Jess, I think don't underestimate the power that young people have. Oh, hello, there you are. I'm just doing a little bit of a wrap up of your session because we do have to move on, but I just wanted to say don't, don't underestimate the power that you have as a young person. The more than ever, and probably thanks to Greta, uh, politicians, bosses, leaders, um, they're all open now to having some of these conversations. So I think what you're doing is incredible. And it's also about building your support network to help you get into those offices or get into those so-called power, you know, power places to start having these conversations because youth are starting to rise and people are starting to listen. So I think you keep going. You've got so much power. You're so passionate and very, very clever about how you go about things. Just keep going. And you, you'll very find that you'll get some wins along the way or you'll certainly find some people who will help you. That is for certain. 100%. You just gotta, it's, as hard as it is and as much as people ignore you and it gets negative at times, believe me, I've had the negative days. You just got to chip away and remember yeah. why you want to do it and why you're there. And they're worth fighting for, that's for sure. All right, thank you so much, Jess, Shark Girl and Alison. That was awesome. We are going to be recording the sessions today, so we'll break them up and we'll put them on our YouTube channel and we'll keep sharing this content because it's all about keeping the conversations going. It's all about building this movement, building momentum and keeping the conversations going. So thank you so much both. Um, we're going to kick into Lucy, Lucy Vogel. I see that you're there. Hello. Hi, Lucy. How are you going? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. I'm sorry, my camera is not working at the very moment. Don't. Second. No stress at all. We'll see if we can find... I don't know if someone can put a pretty picture up of a turtle while of a <laughs> not a turtle, a bit of plastic while we're while we're talking. Um, Lucy Vogel, I'm going to be interviewing you today, Lucy, if that's okay. Oh, wonderful. Um, yes, Lucy, okay. Lucy is one of Melbourne's Ocean Youth alumni. She she um, participated in the Ocean Youth program last year, and as part of the program. Uh, we do a pitch fest. So if young people have got an idea for a solution to some of these big challenges that our oceans face, they get a chance to pitch these ideas and we uh, pro provide some seed funding if the projects are viable to take them to the next level. So I wanted to bring Lucy on today because Lucy has got an incredible project underway and I want to Lucy to share where a little bit about where the projects come from, where she's at, and what it might look like in the future. So Lucy, um, where where did your interest in the environment first come from? I suppose I wanted to start with. My video is not working. Is that all right? I'm so sorry about that. I'll see if I can fix it later on. It's just not the settings. That's okay. In the interim, I'll see if I can find a picture to, to chuck up there. No, okay, that's all right. Um, so, 
I think my love of the ocean specifically came when I was a little kid. I was very much into sailing. I live in Melbourne. Um, I've got lots of family and friends up in Portsea, um, down on the peninsula. So I think every holiday, even sometimes on the weekends, we'd go down and we'd sail. I'm a rower too. So I've got a pretty nice connection with the Yarra. The Yarra River is one of the big um, rivers in Melbourne, if those of you who live elsewhere. And it's just, I, I, it breaks my heart every time I go out in the water and it's disgustingly polluted. There is rubbish everywhere. We see all the ducks floating with things stuck in their feathers and bits of plastic hanging off their feet. And I don't know, I think just loving the environment's kind of always been there for me. Yeah, fair enough, because a lot of people feel like they don't really, well, certainly a lot of young people that we come across feel as though they don't really necessarily have that much of a connection yet so it's just trying to figure out where the connections come from to be able to unlock some of that for, for other people who may not feel it yet so um, so tell us a little bit about what you're working on at the moment so I'm currently developing a line of upcycled um, plastic stationery that's coming from rubbish that I've collected from the Yarra and I'm partnering with this organization called Precious Plastics Monash, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But my project is just on it, um, aiming to address the kind of linear system of consumer consumption and waste that's just become a part of our culture, I guess. Um, it all pretty much started when, uh, I think I was dumping out my pencil case for the school year. I was ready to go on a big, huge shopping trip. And I kind of just collected everything that was dirty or just didn't look very nice because, you know, you want nice stationery, you're starting a new school year, starting it all fresh. And it just kind of dawned on me that I've been doing this for 12 years, countless, countless many pens, countless many rulers and texts and rubbish and all of that. And it just kind of, I don't know, it just, it just started thinking, like, why is this kind of accepted? Like, these pens were made to be reusable but it just seems like such a convenience. You know, like the everyday kind of big pens. And some of them, um, you can screw off the top and you've got those little ink nibs. I wish my camera was on. I've got a couple um, to show you. And when I was doing my shopping trip, I was kind of looking for more sustainable alternatives because currently the pens that we all use, they don't have that option to be um, reused anymore. That's, it's a lot cheaper to make them um, single use. And it just really kind of broke my heart. So I kind of was getting in touch. I was doing a bit of um, networking, talking to office works, trying to find out um, what kind of environmentally friendly uh, products they have. And they really didn't have any. So when I um, came to Ocean Youth and they were asking us to develop a product, that just kind of what came to mind. Yeah, fair enough. And so where are you where are you up to you were working okay i think covid sort of threw a little bit of a spanner for you you were right at the crux of getting some good things going yeah. and then covid struck so at the moment i'm partnering with this organization called precious plastics it's a worldwide movement where they um it's kind of like a creative hub for um innovators they develop these machines um that can turn ordinary plastic water bottles bottle caps, soft plastics even, into um, really amazing and really beautiful things. They make earrings, they make chairs and tables um, and all of that. And they've got some really fantastic worldwide connections. And I reached out to them and they're letting me use their machines at Monash to, um, to build my pens and to further develop my stationary lines. Um, production kind of kicked off for about a week <laughs> we had lots of glitches we were working through it and then all of a sudden schools got shut down restrictions were placed up no one could leave the house it was kind of it's pretty devastating I guess <laughs> but um I don't know it, it's given me a lot of time to I don't know just reevaluate and to get more funding actually I've been applying for a couple more grants um I'm hoping to get some of these machines for myself um, my goal one day is to um, have a bunch of uh, these machines to create pens or other fun things and to go around to schools and to teach uh, plastic um, awareness workshops to kids. 
Yeah, that sounds amazing because it's certainly, um, I've certainly, sorry, I'm just trying to mute a few things here. We've got some sound in the background. Um, yeah, there's certainly no shortage of single-use plastics. I mean, just even post-COVID-19, uh, I'm starting to see lots of masks and gloves and, and mm. lots and lots of <clears throat> coffee cups at the moment because I think all the cafes have gone to um, back to single-use. So there's lots and lots of rubbish around at the moment. Um, yeah. So have you found, do you think that there's a market for your pens? Is it is it... From what you've worked on now, maybe you don't know yet, is there <laughs> scalability within your idea? Well, I did a bit of basket research before I started this project and I did find that there was quite a bit of interest from my local area specifically. I come from quite an environmental school. We're situated right alongside the Yarra, so we're all, all very litter conscious. Um, but I went to a couple of primary schools. I thought primary schools would be kind of the kids that would be like no way that's too hard that I'm kind of <laughs> I don't want to go out of my way and um, have to have to refill up pens every year but they were really really into it I think as climate change becomes more and more of an issue people are constantly looking for ways that they can make small changes in their everyday life um, and yes I took their feedback into account they wanted things that were really easy to refill they wanted things that wouldn't get dirty over time like those kind of clear casings that kind of get a bit gross and grungy so I've been working with their designs at the moment they're pretty bright and colorful and I think they're really cute I wish I could show you guys my camera's not working I really apologize you have um, to send us a photo and I'll include it in the, note, I, in the event notes 100 percent will so I've been collecting lots of colourful plastics. Um, I'm not collecting them by myself. I'm, uh, I've got a friend in the Yarra River Keepers Association. So they're this group that organise kayak cleanups along the Yarra and in some oceans. Um, and they've been giving all their plastic to me, which probably sounds like a nightmare for most people, this big organisation dumping tonnes and tonnes of plastic. <laughs> but it's been super helpful. It saves me a lot of time. Yeah, I imagine. And um, I, I absolutely love this idea because it's one of those things that everyone has, everyone buys, It's mm -hmm. and it's a, an accessible product. You know, it's not going to cost the earth. It's not refitting your house with solar panels. It's it's really accessible to everybody. That's, I just love this idea so much. I think I kind of equate it to the equivalent of... Um, uh, what um, who gives a crap which is my other favorite company at the moment with the toilet paper it's something that we all use and they've come up with a beautiful way to minimize impact in a daily product and they're really irreverent and wonderful and got you know environment at their core so I think your pens you know have got such huge potential oh, thank you <laughs> <laughs> Now, you are also, is it year 11 or year 12? Yeah, I'm in year 12. Year 12. So stressful, you're trying to... Stressful, stressful. Yeah, you're balancing schoolwork while you're doing this project, which is, which is unbelievably admirable and <laughs> inspiring. Um, so I imagine there's a few challenges. Post-COVID or putting COVID aside, have mm -hmm. you come across any challenges yet that are sort of providing roadblocks for you or you've got a bit of a, a clear path? Challenges would have to be, because I obviously don't have the machines myself, um, and so I, it's a bit of a, a trek to get to the machines, and it's constantly just trial and error and trial and error. They're such, like, pens are such little fiddly things, um, and it's constantly, okay, this isn't working, go back to the drawing board, we need different materials, we need to adjust the model, we need to adjust the designs and the heating set settings, and it's test my patience quite a bit, but I'm, I'm pretty motivated to get there. Yeah, I can imagine it is, it's a lot of trial and error, I think, with mm -hmm. something, you're creating something very, very new. Um, I don't know if you heard our last session on businesses saving the, the oceans, but there was um, two innovators on and their words of wisdom were, you're going to fail, so fail fast, learn from it and move on because you're always mm -hmm. iterating as a, as a founder of something new, you're always iterating and learning. So it's about how to have the right mindset, I suppose, when you feel like it's all just getting a little bit too hard. For one of those presenters, Lucy Skelton? 
Uh, it was, no, it was um, Kimberly Bolton from Carabac and we oh, also okay. had Gabby Sankova from Summerside, both creating new products. Okay. I think Lucy was a different episode. Was, she was, she was second. So I'll have to hook you up with um, Kimberly and... Yeah. and um, Wonderful. For yeah. those of you who haven't heard, please give a uh, check out to the Student Voice Network. I promise Lucy I'd say this. It's an amazing platform for youth organisators, organisators organizations who want to get involved and um reach out to other like-minded individuals fantastic yes we'll include that in the notes i've included it in the past <laughs> she's lucy's awesome so um just to sort of wrap it up i mean i suppose apart what what are you most proud of to date with your project or with your with your journey oh i think i'm really really especially proud of how much my like, school community has helped me and I've rallied behind this has really become like a student and a youth-led organization I've had so many people come out with me in the rain in the mud picking up rubbish <laughs> um helping me all my artistic friends helping me draw up designs people supporting me um giving me rides to Clayton every weekend yeah that's what I'm proud of just the help that I've interested that people have given me and the support for my friends and family. Oh, amazing. So lastly, we've been asking all our speakers and participants, what's an action that people can take away today to save our oceans? There's some big, hairy challenges we face. What's something that people can mm -hmm. do? I've had a bit of a think about this and there is one answer for me that stands out a lot more than the rest, and it's surprisingly controversial even now among environmentalists. Um, you've got to go vegan. <laughs> uh. um, I people people do make the connection that like veganism it's not just an ethical issue, which it is part of the reason why I love it. It's not just a health issue; it's a huge environmental issue. And they also don't make the connection between the oceans. I know I've been doing my research for a while. I'm always constantly trying to learn new things. But I found a little while ago that it's 46% of plastic in the ocean is made up of discarded fishing nets. Um, and that was, that was um, a big scientific, organized, scientific um, research project. They did uh, testing on the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and some other areas. And... You know, like obviously that's so far away. Not, I'm sure none of us actively dump fishing nets in the ocean, but when we go and we buy fish products, um, we contribute to that, we fund those industries. And for, like plastic straws, yay, hashtag save the turtles. Like that's really fantastic. And change starts small, but plastic straws account for less than 1% of plastic pollution. And I know that everyone here really, really wants to make a difference. And it seems like such a huge thing but it's it's really it's really really important like scientists harvard oxford they've been saying this for years like the single biggest way to reduce your carbon footprint is to go vegan it'll reduce up by up to what is it 73 percent i think something something around that i know everybody yeah. can't but everybody needs to like <laughs> if, if, if we want to keep surviving as a species if we want our planet to survive and to be still be beautiful and livable and to still have all these incredible diverse creatures that live in it we, we've all got to make change i know nobody likes to you know jump right into this huge challenge but just start educating yourself like no one's ever you're never going to know everything so just keep challenging your beliefs and your ideas and those kind of everyday actions that we take for granted you know i, I never thought about the connection between what i eat and the um and the environment so how how they're all related you know hundred percent Absolutely. And I think you're not alone. I think that's why veganism is one of the fastest growing movements at mm. the moment and has been for some years because of this. Yeah. When you think it all the way through, it's all connected and it all comes down largely yep. to our agricultural systems and our consumption. Yeah. And if you, if you aren't a vegan, like, don't be afraid of the conversation. It's going to feel uncomfortable. Nobody likes to admit that maybe their behaviors need to change but like we, we all want the, the same end goal and if you are a vegan that's so wonderful keep advocate keep being an advocate for it like speak out whenever you can yeah you know absolutely 
All right, I've just got any hand I can get involved with. I uh, Alison's just asked if we've got any local info for Ocean Youth in there in her area. So um, just to wrap up, thank you so much, Lucy, for all that you do. It's incredibly inspiring. Um, Ocean Youth is a program that we have delivered through Sea Life Aquaria to date. So Sea Life Sunshine Coast, Sydney, Melbourne, and Auckland. Uh, but thanks to COVID, um, we have got both, I suppose, new opportunities to go beyond just the aquariums. Um, our animal sites are under the pump at the moment because of, you know, lost visitation. So we're looking for new opportunities as well to be able to grow these movements, support young people who care about the environment, care about oceans in particular. So. We are pivoting like everybody else, trying to get a lot of the content online so we can support a lot of the young people that have approached us from all over the world. Um, but we're also open to starting new chapters where there might be educators who are keen on focusing on SDG 14, which is life below water, uh, and looking at new areas, I suppose. So throughout the series of um, these summits, we're looking at potentially Perth, um, we've got some interest in Borneo, some interest in Tasmania, and now Dunedin through the National Marine Science Centre. So we are looking to grow with through collaborations and partnerships. So if anyone is interested in starting a chapter or certainly working with us to identify new locations, please do uh, get in touch. You can find me at claudette at oceanyouth.org or Ocean Future Fund at gmail.com. I'll put all these in the show in the in the show notes, in the event notes, um, as I have done for the last three sessions. So there is potential opportunity. We've got so many young people who are keen on this. Not just ocean news, but just it's about finding tribe, finding like-minded people, building the movement, supporting each other, not feeling isolated, and understanding that their voices do count. So that's that's our main objectives of supporting young people to influence positive change. So I'm going to wrap it up. We will get in touch with Chloe. I'm sorry, Imogen, I know that you were online to interview Chloe. We'll, we'll have to um, organise another date and we'll put it, as I said, on our YouTube channel. Um, we are going to wrap it up today. So I want to thank all our speakers, all our Ocean Youth alumni. You've done an incredible job doing your interviewing and preparation work. Thank you so much for all that you do. And we will put these interviews up on YouTube, as I mentioned, and I'll send you out some contacts for all the organisations that have been mentioned today. So thank you, everyone, and we'll call it a day.